joining us on the show this week. Absolutely. What brought it on? Made you wanna? What made you wanna? I just get people fucking hit me up all the time, uh, saying when are you gonna be on Podtour again? And really? I'm a big fan of myself, so that was a joke. <laughs> On the show, anyway, Danny Baranowski, back by popular demand, incredibly popular demand. We announced your return, the the return of the thing, on yeah. uh, uh, Facebook on the Podtoid Facebook group. People posted pictures of Captain Picard looking excited, thrilled as they were. All right, I'll and take to, that to celebrate this momentous occasion. This glorious return to form, I'd like to ask Jonathan. Uh huh. Right? If you yeah. fucked me in the ass, if <laughs> would face down ass up be how you would like me to be fucked? What? Just face, answer the question. The face is down. Yeah. Oh, well, is there. What's the other ways? I don't know much about butt sex. It's... Could be equilateral. Equilateral, like a circle, like a perfect balance between head and ass, like the scales of justice, as seen in an American courtroom. Uh, I don't ever want to have. I just want to know if, yeah, ass down, face down, ass up is how we like to fuck. It's as following on from the popular nursery rhyme. I want to see if that applies to you, Jonathan, when you um, serve me what I uh, deserve. I don't... What's this nursery rhyme? What I just did. Oh. Is that that one about the, um... The goose? <laughs> the goose one? I don't know. I don't want to have sex with you at all. <laughs> You're gonna get goosed. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to even be You're gonna get goosed, about. Jonathan, you dirty goose. <laughs> I was thinking about... You're gonna lay the golden egg on my chest. <laughs> Gross. That'd be a poo, probably, I guess. I was told you it was poo! And it wouldn't be gold, it would be uh, all of your brown. Yeah, so it's good to be back. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, things haven't changed, Daddy, since no. you last time. They've gotten steadily worse. No, no, I, I remember last time, though, when I did it, like, it was, you know, how we are as creative people, how you'll see, like, a thousand positive comments and the one shitty comment that you remember. And the one for me was when it was, like, this guy said I was liberal and vulgar. And I'm like... <laughs> How did I? How did I stand out? Like, yeah. what? <laughs> uh, both those things have only gotten worse. Oh right. Uh, so we're ch- ch- uh, chest shitting communists. Now. Yes, indeed. <laughs> That's the subtitle of the show. <laughs> I think all of the squeaky clean right wingers have departed us in the <laughs> in the intervening. I mean, how long has it been? A long time. Oh fuck. Uh, yeah. No, I was I was in Arizona when we did it. I remember. Um, I'm in a different state now. A oh, better state you're in now? Uh, I moved to Kirkland, Washington. Ah. Uh, east, east side of Seattle, man. I love it. Where in Arizona uh, were you living? Uh, I was in Mesa, which is... Oh, east God. Side. Oh, God. Um, oh. Conrad, I don't think I've met you, Conrad. So. No. Not that no, time. but I know Mesa. Oh, God. I remember when they passed that law in the late 90s where they, they were trying to find people for smoking outside that is a horrible place i don't i don't remember that but that's my hometown so thanks oh <laughs> conrad um no, i lived in moved. phoenix for 20 yeah. years and well, have since moved to the pacific northwest as well oh yeah well no so you know why I love oh yeah Maine, but yeah it's uh but you then you know too that arizona is kind of uh, more complicated than people it really is everyone, like, everyone lumps it in with like south carolina and florida and shit like Oh yeah, they passed laws to pull over brown people and stuff, and that is technically true. But there's also like our governor was Janet Napolitano. Like it's it's a, and yeah, there's Flagstaff no. and Tucson. Like it's a really diverse place. Just all the diversity is separated by wasteland. So yes, the, the, like I always thought it was interesting in Arizona that cause, you know living in Phoenix, you could go 90 minutes in either direction and get completely different experiences out of the state. 
Yep. It, it was just stunning. Now, the Los Angeles to Phoenix line is entirely barren wasteland, but uh, yeah. every other direction is really interesting. Right. But no, I've, you're talking about the you're talking about the sixty because uh, we used to go to Disneyland like twice a year and yeah. uh, like every year. So I've done I've driven that like hunt, fuck hundreds of times probably. <laughs> It's it's interesting because there isn't like a lot of culture necessarily, but you're close enough to LA that a day trip's not out of the question if you wanted to do something cool. Right, but uh, Phoenix is kind of like the gateway between the South and LA. Like, yes, it's, it's this weird like it's it's such a weird like it's half it. What is it like? Is it a flyover state or is it West Coast? Like what the fuck is it? Like it's yeah. It is definitely an odd place. I was uh, glad to have lived there and, and equally glad to leave. Well, it's also, you know, 100 degrees there still. But let's talk yeah, about let's talk more about weather fast. and geography. Um, yeah. I'm sure this is fascinating. It's a favorite. I, I, I'm, I am fascinated because in two minutes, Dennis got more words out of Conrad per episode than, than the hours we've done. <laughs> That was a real conversation. <laughs> which oh, is you actually... just got to have something to connect on. Yeah. Um, that's actually a so, first for Pontoid, an actual conversation. So we're breaking all the records. So, Con- Conrad, how do you like to fuck? Um, <laughs> I'm married now. Not Go at all. On. Yeah, I'm, li- I'm it's listening. It's a lot of effort. I, I get sweaty. That's actually a pretty frequent topic, is how tedious and boring and time-consuming sex is. Conrad prefers to just potter around in the garden with a book. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's that's the best euphemism I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> People might not know who Danny is. Isn't that weird? How's that possible? We should introduce. Those you know, people so. are not to be associated with, Jonathan. They're perverts. It's <laughs> <laughs> They're puttering around in the garden with books. Yeah. <laughs> Filthy bastards. <laughs> Some people don't know about the people that make videos. I know. It's sad. But it Danny is. does. Danny does music. Don't you, Danny? Allegedly. You did it. You, what are you doing now? I haven't heard what you did. What'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm doing uh, Necrodancer. I don't know if you uh, were you. I don't oh. know if you were at PAX, Jonathan, but uh, but you were. It's, I saw you, and I'm fucking stupid. Um, yeah. Oh, but just for a second in a Sony thing. No yeah, second. yeah, I got... Oh, I got I got to touch your body. And so... I didn't see you at all this year. I'm sad because that was probably my last PAX as well. I did not see you. Why is it your last PAX? Are you dying? Yes. <laughs> that too. Of, um... of all of the illnesses that you can die from. <laughs> Jim is, uh, he does all these conventions now. You just did one this uh, weekend, right, Jim? Yeah, so the Escapist Expo, Jonathan. Right. And I did a panel. And I told everyone, I, I read out your Twitter handle, Jonathan, and I told everyone to tell you to put on a mesh tank top and call you a lovely boy. <laughs> uh, nobody's done that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, sorry. You know, you made the instructions so simple, and yet... Exactly, they had one job. Mm. Actually, I did distract them all. Jonathan, you haven't lived until you have been on a stage in a room full of people and shouted into a microphone, say my name, and everyone did it. <laughs> It makes you feel like a, a warlord from the apocalypse. <laughs> that does sound pretty fun. Does sound but were, see, were, hmm? Every time I've seen you on a panel, Jim, I've wondered why there wasn't a t-shirt cannon. There should be, and Jonathan should be the one firing it. And it shouldn't right. fire t-shirts. It should fire dicks. <laughs> no, no, that's no good. You can get uh, some, Jonathan. You what? geld some of your patients at, you know, at the hospital where you work. What? Just like, what? just, just like, get a, a piece of piano wire, right, Jonathan? Uh oh. When, when bad one. this isn't when your patients are sedated, right? To wrap the piano wire around the penis of of the people in your care, entrusted to you, who trust you implicitly. And just just tie it off, and then just just leave that there for a few hours. Eventually, it'll just slough off after you know it's been starved of blood. And you just pop that in the cannon. Huh. Yes, yeah. Jim. We have guests over. What? We've got company in the, in the living room. I ain't on my bed. We're talking about <laughs> you're talking about the the dick things, the cuts. 
the dick cutoffs. Uh, People have to learn. <laughs> Uh, were you warmly received at the thing, Jim? Were you, uh, you were allowed. warmly received in my bum hole. <laughs> people, uh, people want to have sex with you. You, you want to have sex with me. As, as Guilty! <laughs> I don't know if you got, uh, advances. Anyone advance on you? No. Advance no. no. I, I won't lie. Uh-huh. There is a, a small weird percentage of the human race that mm. will want to have sex with me. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, Jonathan. Sure, why would you lie about that? Why would I make that up? I don't know why you would. To make myself look like a stud. <laughs> <laughs> but even among those, I have been informed reliably by people who would and have had an opportunity <laughs> that I am too scary. <laughs> So it's like it's like already the um, the statistics are not in my favor. Well, there's uh, there's rule thirty four for you, right? Plenty of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that really? should get the juices flowing, right? I mean, like if they're scared of you, you can just kind of warm them up with, you know. I should do that. I should walk around with like the lining of my coat, just <laughs> just wallpapered with rule thirty four <laughs> of me. I just just lift it open and just say, I bet it's like Niagara Falls down there now. Hey, Jonathan? Oh, yeah. Hey? Hey? Not for me. No. It's a plan sorry. that we've just worked out, me and Dan. Reminds me of that episode of Different Strokes. Oh, Wait, give you some I was just going to say that. You too? Where the, the old man is like, just watch a few videos, Arnold. Don't I actually, worry about it. Yeah. I actually have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> There's a episode of Different Strokes where a man gets Arnold Drummond, a little African-American boy who'd been adopted by Mr. Drummond, played by Conrad Bain, if recollection serves. And uh, this man is uh, trying to get Arnold Drummond warmed up sexually with pornography. I've, I never even watched Different Strokes, but I've heard of that episode. It was like one of their very special episodes. It things. was. Yeah. And one of the, he got one of the other kids, and the kid was sad. Oh, he actually won. Yeah, he won. <laughs> he was, in fact, a, a real sex criminal, and there was a real the sex character, criminal. not the actor. Yeah, the, the character he played one on TV, and um, it was scary. It was scary to think about a, a man wanting to make a boy horny with pornography. I don't know if little boys uh, get horny from pornography. Uh, you should conduct an experiment to find out, Jonathan. Oh, that the, what? Why would I? How would I? So that we can. Well, so what you do is you, you you get a book and you go in the garden. Uh huh. <laughs> you sh you could just like like go to school, yeah. pass yourself off as a student counselor. I'm sure that's fine. In the name of research, you could save lives. I think you could pass out. I think you could pass out. Yeah. That. You just say, "Oh, hey, I'm the new counselor, uh, counselor Merryweather man." Like who doesn't want to go see Mr. Holmes? Yeah, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, just give him your real name and address. Oh, <laughs> uh, sit in an office and then just say, like, just talk to the receptionist and say, send in the boys. <laughs> and then they'll just send in some boys. So, little Billy, I, I know your body is going through some hormonal changes and, and things are changing. I'd, I'd like you to tell me about that. <laughs> like, you know, in excruciating and, detail, I'd like you to explain to me how you feel about that. Put on like close the door. Close the door. Put one of the Emmanuel sequels on the TV, the VHS, <laughs> and just just look at the boys. Just go and do you like that? Uh, it's uncomfortable. They did an airplane though, kind of. That one airplane pilot said to a boy, uh, something. You like Roman movies? <laughs> Ever seen a grown man naked? Yeah, you remember. You like movies about gladiators? Yeah. Oh yeah. Necromancer. Reckon Necrodancer. You're Necrodancer. Doing. People may not know what it is. Tell them what it is. Uh, so Necrodancer is a rhythm-based roguelike um, that I'm doing music for. Uh, it's a game by Ryan Clark of Brace Yourself Games, art by Ted Martins. Uh, let's see. It's, uh, I don't... Kevin and Jesse also worked on it. I don't know their last names because I'm a fucking asshole. But, um, oh, that's all right. It's uh, basically, it was at uh, PAX. There was a, you can play with a DDR controller. Um, 
and you have to just move in the cardinal directions on the beat. And it's a video game. It's, it's a video game I tried to play like half a dozen times at PAX and could not because there was this mass of people around it every time I went past. Yeah, that was that was cool, man. That was that was a good time. It was uh, it was really popular. <laughs> um, I, I think people mostly are just fascinated that there's still any fucking reason to have a DDR pad. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean that would draw a crowd. But it's beyond that. I, I uh, retrograde a game that came out a while ago. Uh, used the yeah, yeah. Star Hero. Yeah, you remember that. And yeah. everyone had one of those, and it was a good game, but it just didn't catch on in people's brains in the way that uh, Crypt and the Necrodancer is. For yeah, I, I think, well, I mean, so it's, it's I think it's, for, I mean, first of all, it's just really fun um, to even just play with a, a keyboard. So, like, the DDR thing, like, I don't want to say it's, like, a gimmick or whatever, but, like, I understand, like, a lot of people aren't going to have a DDR pad lying around. Um but so it's it's we had it on demo on the on the laptops too there and those were those were packed the whole time too. Um, it's just one of those things where it's like the 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 there's just like a bonus to the game where like oh yeah if you want to be fucking crazy and whatever you can get on a DDR pad uh, or not and so it's just like that's that's the bonus like just if you want to. So. Sure. Yeah, it adds a different dimension to what it shows the. Uh, to me, it, it says a lot about the developers that they're willing to do that. Like, people are really looking for developers who are excited about doing strange new things for people and are willing to take risks. And knowing that the developers were willing to do that says to you, these guys are going to give me something weird. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, Ryan seems really... Uh, uh, first of all, it's well, why didn't anybody think of this game? It's like the first thing I think of. Like, Why is this the first cool. time this has been done? Because it seems like... You know, a, a, a roguelike where you move on the beat. I mean, maybe it's just because like roguelikes are, are, are hot right now or whatever. But yeah, he's uh, with with work with him, with, with him and stuff. I can just throw out the craziest fucking ideas, and a lot of times I'll have crazy sound ideas or something I want to do, and they're just like, yeah, that's not possible. Don't be an idiot. Uh, and Ryan's just like, all right, I'll try to figure something out. And you know, that's cool. That uh, he wants to do a lot of really cool stuff with audio. And that's not always the case. So it's really fun to work on something like that where, you know, I get to spread my wings and fly away. <laughs> Have you ever done a rhythm game before? I uh, should just, I don't want to interrupt, but I should just point out, because I see what yeah. Jonathan's doing. Yeah. You're perfectly welcome to, Danny. You, you can talk about video games if you want. Oh. He's trying to use you as an excuse to talk about video games, which he uh. knows, which he knows is not cool. <laughs> Uh, uh, but you're perfectly welcome to do it, but I'm just saying don't feel tight, don't feel pressured into doing it. It's not just any game. It's he's just, he's like the kids at school that try, try and pressure boys into smoking, Yeah. and they're like, no. oh, you want to be cool, don't you? That's him. And he does that to actual boys at school now. I don't. Well, see, so, so now I just feel stupid for being like semi-genuine for a minute, so thanks a lot, Jonathan. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> he'll do that to you. Like, he'll, he'll just sort of... He, he's a user. He's a user. He, no, he, he, no, he's a pusher. Yeah, I'm the user. He's pushing it on me. Oh, I'm the victim talking. here. I was, I was really. You are like that smoky man who gives heroin to cartoon characters, and then all the cartoon characters join up and say, "Stop doing drugs." I feel like we watch different cartoons. <laughs> I just wanted to know what he was doing. I was excited about it. I like the stuff that he does. Well, anyway. he's he can talk about that, but you stop trying to sneak in. Opinions about things. I was. I, 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 the last question I asked him is if he'd ever done a rhythm game before. You are a naughty boy, and I'm going to give you a spanking. I thought I know about all the Danny games. I don't um, think I know about a rhythm I, one. I don't. I don't think I have before. Um, uh, yeah. It's something I do want to try to do more. It's the the thing with rhythm games though is that like <clears throat> there's a it's. It feels like it's been done to exhaustion in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of stuff, and like Necrodancer, I think shows that where like there is still ideas that haven't been done yet with rhythm games. Because like you know, Rock Band and Guitar Hero came, and they were fucking awesome, man. I played Rock Band and Guitar Hero for a long time. I got the uh, what's it called? what's that thing called the DJ or stage kit for Rock Band, where it's like a strobe light and a fog machine uh, and, a, and a light thing for Rock Band, and like we used to have parties at my house. And just everyone just got drunk and had, you know, the fog machine would go off in the strobe light and like 
my normal friends who didn't really play video games would come over and, and play. And like, that's awesome, man. That was really cool. But like, it's gone now. Like, who plays Rock Band? And that's and that's it's too bad. But I play Rock Band like every week. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> you I, are. Like, but I don't think I'm talking uh, about yeah. broad strokes like like no, in general like but no 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 I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying you, you i'm just saying you've marginalized me <laughs> it hurts. all right well then we're even for when you told me my hometown was shit it's still <laughs> shit yeah <laughs> it's weird. my hometown shit too don't worry about it all right well let's i come just... from a i come from a crappy place in pennsylvania that thinks it's far more important than it actually is yeah. i'm actually proud of how shit my hometown is it's actually in a book the worst cities in Britain. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's it's awful. It's just like a big slab of concrete. Full is that of... the kind of books you guys have, like in Britain? Like you just have books about how awful everything is? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm proud that also a restaurant I used to eat at when I was in college was number two on a TV show of the worst restaurants in Britain. They used to reheat all the leftovers that people didn't eat the night before. Whoa, really? <laughs> yeah, sold them back to you. Full price. Uh, it was actually called the Half Price Curry House. Everything on the menu was half price always. And so there you go. At least... Half of the other guys' prices or just... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they were obviously doubling down on their food. So they could... They passed the savings on to the consumer. Which, in my opinion, is is the right thing to do. Even it's capitalism. Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday's food today. Uh, disgusting. Danny, what do you think about Sammy Hagar? Uh, so I'm looking at my poster of him on the wall right now. <laughs> really? Yeah. Is it from the hairy chest days and the flexing? Flexing the small arms days? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that lyric he sings on Pound Cake? When he's just like, Homegrown, down home, yeah! I'm sorry, I actually don't know who Sammy Hagar is, but I'm very uncomfortable right now. (laughs) Jonathan does that a lot. He makes up uh, singers. (laughs) Real? There's no such thing as Sammy Hagar. Stop stop telling stories. He's so real, come on. Dang, I can't drive. 55! He's actually. Ah! He's just screeching. Have you had your bottle? I'm sorry. Me and Conrad have tried to raise him right, but he acts up when we have guests. Makes up stories about this Sammy Hagar, one of his <laughs> invisible friends. He was the second singer for Van Halen. From what? Van Halen. I don't care what he drove. Eddie, Eddie Van Halen. Come on. You know. Is that some sort of have... limp? You t- it's American rock and roll. Dan- American what and what? <laughs> David Lee Roth. You remember. And then Gary Sharon was the third singer, I believe. I've heard of the song My Sharona. Is that it? <laughs> Are you yeah. saying that's a person? No, no, no. Sammy Hagar. No, 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 no. There's oh, no my lip. baby's pound cake. No? Pound, you want a pound of cake. That's a, it's a, it's a euphemism. You're disgusting. <laughs> That's perfectly good cake. Starving babes in Africa could eat that cake while you're pounding it. While I'm, you're I'm, just... I'm sorry, kilogram cake, you fucking Nazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hitler didn't take over this country yet, as much as you and your boys in the boots would like it to be that way. My boy in the boots? I'm a Nazi? Why am I a Nazi? Was it Sammy Hagar? <laughs> I don't know why you're a Nazi, Holmes, but yeah. it, it, it hurts me. We've been because... asking that question. Wasn't yeah. Sammy Hagar also in Boys in Boots? <laughs> he was a Nazi. Rock and Roll Band? No, he wasn't. He's a, uh, an American. Oh, Nazi apology. <laughs> Next you're going to tell us that Joseph Mengele really was doing everything he did in the interests of science. Speaking of Joseph Mengele... I was uh, a, which you do every day, speaking of him. I never speak of Joe Mengele. You talk about him. You bring him up usually saying that I know him. Or he's, <laughs> he's, uh, I don't think he's alive. You went to college with him. You went to the same medical school. <laughs> and the, the, medical the difference school. is you carry your ones out in secret. <laughs> Passing yourself not, uh, off as a medicine man. 
why is it fun to imagine me being the worst? <laughs> It's not for me. I don't like imagining. Like, I wonder if I was the one doing all the harm. Like, nope, not fun to think about. But you're like, I want to think about it some more. That was like, cut off a testicle. You do it, do it, do it. You bad boy. This is what you do. You are um, a bad boy. You're the bad boy of pop. <laughs> you know this. Bobby Brown. That's uh, Bobby Brown is the bad you boy. You are a brown Bobby boy. I am a brown Bobby boy. True. Uh, but I am not Bobby Brown, the boy. Band. Leader. New edition. <laughs> not new edition. True. Uh, it's true. That's it's not true. Failing. You could have been in Cameo. I love Cameo. Yeah, why weren't you in it? Wow. Uh, I was too young. Uh, excuses. I was like 12 or something when Word Up came out, I think. Excuses. Are you familiar with Cameo, Danny? Uh... Yeah. I know. I know it's a word. <laughs> it's a word up. Yeah, it's the code word. Every time you hear it, you know you will be heard. Oh. All right. Are you gonna just continue spinning webs of lies, or are you gonna fucking tell me what it is? <laughs> there was a guy. He had a mustache. He was athletic. He had big hair. Stood straight up. I used to have hair like that, actually. And he looks yeah, in so the. So far, camera. you're just talking about yourself. No, no, I wish. I, I would love to be like, I think his name is like Maurice Blackman, too. I don't know if that's a real name. Uh, but he was uh, the lead in a band called Cameo. It was similar to Chromio, but better. And he looked straight into the camera and said, Word up! It's the cold word! Like, ah, oh, why are you after me? <laughs> why, are you, why are you doing the alarm voice into my face about a word? And, um talks about music and stuff if you can use it uh no he ain't got no time for psychological romance is one of the other lyrics huh it implies he only wants like to have sex with people who have no psychology they're just like lumps of clay basically with no i think that's what that song was about was just like having sex with lumps of clay Yeah, it, and it's uh, like word up, like that was the code word for mm. when the workers were coming back to the quarry, and they'd have to pull up their pants and run away, because <laughs> they go down the quarry and just fuck the the ground there. Word up, the cops are back. Yeah, word up, they're coming back. <laughs> Get your penis out of that cliff. Yeah, as, as I recall, the lyrics go, um, We ain't got no time for psychological romance. No, no romance. No romance. That does no sound. Romance. <laughs> no romance. Come on, tell me, baby, what? No word, no word up. You remember it well. Yeah, uh, having sex with Clay. I was listening to it on the plane back from uh, North Carolina. Really? Yeah, just the other day. Because it's one of the few songs I've got left on my iPad. What happened to your iPad songs? Nothing, but uh, I didn't buy that many, and when I switched oh. things, I couldn't bring over the ones that I didn't buy. Plus, everything I do is on um, that Spotify thing now. Oh, right. Which some people tell me is, is immoral to use, so I don't know if that's immoral to use it. Um, I, uh, you make a music, you know. Uh, uh, make uh, so, I, yeah. I, will say, uh, I got some stuff on Spotify, and... Uh, it's uh, it's uh, you know, it's ba- Spotify to me is basically like better than piracy is what you're getting. What you're getting with Spotify is the people who just fucking pirate it anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's not it's not a ton of money, and you're not actually like selling anything, giving it to them. So I make you know I make a nice little bonus from from Spotify. I mean it's it's a lot of plays for how much you get, and it's kind of low, but you know if you can get a few successful albums up there, I mean you could probably pay the bills. That's you know. So when you say I'm, sure, I'm sure it sucks for fucking Metallica, but fuck them. <laughs> yeah, they did it to themselves. Yeah. Why would it suck for Metallica? They're already. It's not like it's eating into their album sales and stuff. Do you think? No, it's Met- just like radio, isn't it? Metallica it- doesn't understand the world, as far as I know. Mm. Yeah, like you remember they're they're crusade against Napster and all that shit. Like, yeah. It, I don't know. That was a long time ago. Maybe they're different now. But like, I'm just saying, like. There was, cause there was all these weird articles and stuff where it's like, oh yeah, you know, Lady Gaga only made you know this much money from it or whatever, and it's like, you just made money off of somebody spending time listening to something, and they didn't take anything of yours, whatever. Like, it's fucking, it's okay. Like, otherwise they would have gone to the pirate bay and just done it for free. Like, it's, 
I don't know. Should it be more? Fuck yeah. I want to get paid. I want money. I want bitches. But like, I mean, yeah. yeah. It, that yeah. shit is just such so weird and like in flux right now. You know, five well, years yeah. ago, what was it? What was a Spotify? And like, so who knows? Five years from now, it's probably just gonna be like psychic beams to your brain of music, and you know, sure. Here's a well, compromise. Can... What uh, if every time someone played one of your songs, Jonathan Holmes went to your house and gave you a packet of Starburst? Are we doing euphemisms again? <laughs> I would leave that up to the discretion of the artist. They can take would, a literal or a euphemism. I would let him burst my star anytime. That's Search. good. So, Jonathan, every time someone plays uh, one of Danny's songs on Spotify, you pop round and give him a cheeky squirt. What's a cheeky squirt? Mm. <laughs> That's it's a starburst. So should I log in and see how many uh, how many starbursts he owes me? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, earlier this afternoon, while well, while well Danny checks that, earlier this afternoon, I actually thought about making you sell packets of starburst. Making me? Yeah, like buying a wholesale job lot of starburst, taking the wrappers off them and putting new wrappers on that said Val Kilmer chews. <laughs> and you'd He's sell not that. He's not working. Do you want to? <laughs> he is. I'm. I can he was sell the him. Batman. That's what he it's going to say on the tube, on the packaging. It's going to say the man who was the bat, Val Kilmer chews, and a, maybe a picture of his gurning face. Okay, so I, bacon face. So I got to, I got to, I got to do some math here. Um, and let me. Uh, so, okay, so you owe me six point two billion butt fucks. Six point two million. Is billion. 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 You've gotten that many on on uh, on the Spotify? And that apparently has... no. Okay, I did the math wrong. I've done. I've had more listens than there are people in the world. So <laughs> that's how much butt sex you owe me. You can do the conversion. Yeah, and that's not like seconds of it. That's like full, like from the beginning, from the first penetration to the issue of your ejaculate. Right. Right. Yeah. I have Thank to ejaculate. You. And if I were you, like as soon as you've um, spilled your filthy seed. I'd get cracking again. Well, he's not really spilling it. He's he's utilizing it. I like, guess it's not dis- spilling. Yeah, it dispenses. I mean, spilling in like the biblical sense because it's not landing on a uterus, but still, like it's it's not, you know, it's not going out the window. Yeah. Depositing. <laughs> You're totally right. I apologize. You like you so like you, that. what you do is you deposit your gooey Louie, right? Yeah. yeah. And then just I would carry on. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to want to get right back in there. Yeah. Time's limited if you're going to be able to fulfill this contract. Oh, well, I mean, it could. Would it transition to uh, the next generation of Baranowski if, uh, you if will, the contract wasn't children? fulfilled yeah. as of the time of his death? I mean, you know, who, who, who retains ownership of the, the contract in the event of Danny's death? Of the seed? Of the man of having the continual sex. reception of, of Jonathan's uh, oaken stuff. Oh, right. right, right, right. No, okay, well, um, yeah, you're just going to have to do it to my children. <laughs> have you considered yeah. maybe a tauntaun? A where, tauntaun? Where I, I forget what it's called. One of those pacts that soldiers had in the World War, where... Me, you, and Conrad collaborate, and they each chip in a Spotify listen. And the last of us to remain alive gets a big fuck up the ass from Jonathan. Well, I feel like if we're if we're ever going to hit this number, we're going to need the the collaboration of a team of scientists internationally and uh, a, a broad coalition of nations to put all the resources towards it. Um, and it's probably going to take decades, centuries, millennia, even. But then hopefully one day, uh, in the far future, when the universe has died of heat death uh, and all black holes have exhausted themselves through hawking radiation, I will be satisfied. I was happy. So, when- Jonathan, if I, were you, I didn't even know why you're still sat there. You need to get on a what? plane right now. If you want to make it back in time for the next Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you are going to have to get cracking. I can't pay attention to that show. It's so hard to pay attention to. Have you tried it's watching? pretty boring. Yeah. There's just yeah. a conversation happening with uh, some people that are serious face, and then I've not them. seen it at all. I just wanted to name drop a popular show for so that people. I don't know listening. that it's a popular show. I just think it's heavily it marketed. It's watched. It's watched a lot. Well, it's a show that some people have seen. 
Because yeah. when they listen to it later on their MP3 personal um, stereo cassette players, they will say, oh, I know that show. These guys are on my level. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know anything about it except like that. I saw the trailer once, but like that agent guy that died in the movie is he just like in it for no reason? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, they. Like, I, I remember I was watching the trailer and it was just like it was basically like, oh, I'm alive now. Oh, wow. Like what? Like is there? Supposed- well, there's they've hinted at something weird going on with that, but yeah, it's still pretty, you know, dumb. But you know, I, I've read oh. I've, I've read enough comics and I'm self aware enough about them. To I can't get hypercritical about it because comic books are pretty dumb a lot of the time too. So it's well, hard to get too standard? critical. When actors start acting, you expect a different standard than when uh, little drawings have word balloons next to them and stuff. Not when I realize that the source material is effectively the same. Mm. All right, uh, fair enough. If anything, uh, the fact that someone who we saw die is now alive again because of reasons is one of the most sort of canonically authentic things I've ever seen an adaptation do. Sure. Uh, it's like the, the, the cynical part of me was like, oh, so that's the only actor they could afford from the movie. <laughs> Actually, well, no, because is... they shoehorned in that uh, girl from How I Met Your Mother who was in the in the Avengers movie. Yeah, she's in it too. Didn't Samuel L. Jackson have a little appearance in the in the we in the episode from a week ago? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah, see that. Huh. So huh? yeah. Cool. Well, as you probably They're know, trying, it's but it's but so not the idea good. is, I guess, for the show is the idea that like Agents of Shield is this just like so the real guys, the Iron Mans and the Hulks and shit, they're doing like real shit, but like you know. Bubble Girl needs to like refill the toner in the printer. Like, is that what's going on? Like, no, it's not really superhero-y. Um, it's more that they're they're like the recruiting group, or you know, the sort of ground unit, human resistance, trying to understand and deal with shit. Think Men in Black. That's really more what it is. Yeah, yeah. Men there in Black a... without that, without being that smart. Men in Black without Will Smith or Tommy Lee Jones. Right. And it's probably got a shield. He's probably a shield replicant, Danny B. Do you know about that? Oh, guys? yeah. I'm pretty sure Coulson's a life model decoy. Life model decoy. That's right. Because he says, I was in Tahiti. And then a man. It's like, a magical a place. <laughs> yeah. Then a man. Well, he said that. That's his instinct. He has an, an autonomic response to mentions of Tahiti where he says, it's a magical place. Oh. I didn't notice it, that. It's cropped up in two or three episodes now. Oh, interesting. Could be just bad writing. It is Joss Whedon, right? Yep. Oh, oh it's, it's Joss Whedon? He's producing or telling people what to write. Yeah. It's got a lot of Whedon snark and like... Jonathan. Yeah, I, might, uh, I might have to give it a shot. Oh, that's, maybe you like it. That's a, that's a seal. Of, I love everything that fucking guy does. Jonathan, yeah. I'm, I'm writing a TV show for you to star in. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's too bad. <laughs> You'll like it. It's called Agents of Ali McBeald. <laughs> where you walk around in a suit dress and say, oh, lawyers and emotions. <laughs> Me as McBeal? Yeah, and you got to get really skinny and we're going to starve you in a cellar. <laughs> lawyers not... and emotions. <laughs> I'm not a convincing McBeal, let's face it. Let's face and it. it's like, what do they do in that show? Like, every three seconds, they cut to some rabbit in a green room or other random things, like an orange rolling down a hill into a small <laughs> child's mouth. <laughs> like, that happens every three seconds. So it's like you for a second saying, oh, I've got to have sex with a man. And then it cuts to, like, a bucket being swung about the head of an old lady who's <laughs> saying, hey, my best years have departed me. And then it cuts back to you, Jonathan, and you're saying, oh, look at my perky breasts. And then it cuts away to, like, a dog being chased by a criminal. And the criminal is saying, now it is you who is to be arrested for stealing the jewels. <laughs> the dog? Yeah, it all means something, Jonathan. I'll work out what it means later, but for Did now, just, it means... Did you just have an acid flashback, Jim? Oh, he's just free associating. I had acid reflux. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about right. Do you guys know that Metallica lyric? Remember, remember when we were talking about Metallica? Who? Metallica. What? You remember Metallica, Jim? Metallica. We were uh, talking about him earlier, like uh, seven, seven. Did they do uh, the Ace of Base? 
They did not. They did um, Master of Puppets, which some people think is kind of like Ace of Spades. No, no, no. Disney did that. Did Master of Puppets? Yeah. Master of Puppets contains the lyrics. I was thinking of Pinocchio. Those are different. Oh, he is a puppet. Uh, Jonathan? Yes? Will you ever dress up as Pinocchio? And, no. and dance around E3 going, I got no strings to hold me down. And just that, because that's the only lyric I remember. No, I won't. Oh. I will not do oh, that. You don't meet me halfway, are you? Oh, no. 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 There's a Metallica lyric that goes, Taste me, you will see. More is all you need. Remember? Uh... He's enthusiastically asking you to taste it. Well, why don't you ever do that? Why don't you take a, a page out of Metallica's book? Because that's such a dumb lyric. How can you out loud? It, it shows how different rock and roll music was then. Today, there would be a producer saying, you can't look into the crowd, James Hetfield, and yell, taste me! Yeah, you, can't. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't put those two words next to each other in a rock and roll show. Uh, but back then, it was anything goes. My Indigo wow. Prophecy video finally processed. Oh, oh, wow. I was wondering if that was going to ever yeah. go up. I'm what stopping the show now just to promote my own shit on Twitter. Tell me about your thing. What is it? I'm playing Indigo Prophecy on the internet to get my um, 2003 views. <laughs> How is it different than Beyond Two Souls, a video game that you reviewed? It's uh, good, is Indigo it's Prophecy. Yeah, it's it's way better. It's worse over time. Yeah, they kind of just made the games less and less interesting... And the story is more and more, like, just pretentious. Indigo Prophecy was fucking ridiculous and stupid. But it was very tense, and there was a sense of real, like, I've got to do this or the guy will be in trouble now. Which isn't in Heavy Rain and, and beyond once you realise that none of your input actually matters. The, like, your interactions with the game are purely optional, because David Cage has a very important story to tell you. So, that's that. Indigo Prophecy, I loved it back in the day. Um, it's fucking stupid, thinking back on it in the modern age. Uh, but, it is uh, very enjoyable as a thing uh, to play. So I've been playing it. It was more like a video game, I'm guessing, based on your review of Beyond Two Souls, where it's just kind of... It sounds like the least gameplay-focused one yet, and the most just watch the stuff and then press A to... Or oh yeah, I mean, even even in dialogue, eventually, like you'll get dialogue choices, and eventually two of them will shrink, and the game will just decide which one you want to say. <laughs> and it's a shame because when I first heard about it, I thought, "Whoa, he's finally gonna make like a video game video game," because you play as a ghost, and when I play a video game, I often feel like I am possessing the character that I'm playing. Because it's like controlling the body of somebody else. They're like a, a puppeteer, like you were saying earlier. Uh, but it sounds like they didn't take advantage of that at all. And instead you are just kind of sitting back watching things happen instead of actually possessing the characters and causing them to do things on screen all that much. This is uh, Beyond Two Souls you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, all I mean, all I really saw was Jim's apparently abomination of a review that is worse than Hitler, Pol Pot, and Obama combined or something. <laughs> Were people mad about the review, Jim? I didn't see any of the comments because I was sleeping. It is, yeah. It's every every time I go and see like anything that Jim does that is slightly could possibly be constrained as somewhat not 100% polite or non... I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. There's always just the contingent of just like... Oh, you fu I don't know why they have like my impression of your voice, but like, oh, you fuck you fat person, you don't know your games, and <laughs> like, that's, oh, I don't know why. I don't know why they're you. I don't know why you are your commenters. I, that I are don't know why I sound like Hagrid. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking fat person, you review the game bad, and you're a wizard. <laughs> oh, you probably can't enjoy a game because you've got heart disease. <laughs> And I wonder you can get your sausage fingers on a controller. <laughs> very mentally ill, this person. Which is probably true. Um, but yeah, people were mad. Hey, let's get Lee on here. Yeah. Not to tell you how to do your shit, but get fucking Lee on here. And... Oh, Lee Alexander? Yeah. She's yeah. interested so I've been... in coming on, and you know what? 
Why not? Let's invite everybody we know on. Until it's just a loud cacophony, but can I just invite there. all on my on my uh, <laughs> yeah, contact just, list? Have you got Lee on your thing? Because uh, I don't. She doesn't trust me with any see. contact details. <laughs> who, who That's would? probably not true. She's just you know doing stuff. Who would, Jonathan? They've all seen what I do to you. Oh, no one watches or listens to this show. They don't care. <laughs> not that good. You sell this show very well. I um, won't stop until no one listens. That's my I just goal. asked her uh, for her Skype name. Um, oh, stuff might happen. Yeah, we've we've been talking we've been talking for a long time about like uh, uh, we think it'd be funny to do like a podcast, but it's like in the form of like a morning show, like a morning zoo, like <laughs> Danny B and the Leap. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lee's telling us she's had three vodkas and doesn't want to come on uh, in that that's, condition. That's the, that's the perfect zone, though. If it makes her feel better, I will just start taking it as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I fell. You okay? You... Did, did you knock over the box? Sound like oh. you, he's not in a case. Is he alright? Is he really alright? I'm good. <laughs> Why are you so far away? I fell out of my chair. Oh, so you're down on the ground. Yeah, I think I'll stay here. <laughs> sound like you're a cave dweller. You sound far away. Come closer, come on. I'm alright. Oh, there you are. I'm sat on the floor still. Sound good. Are you so fat you're breaking your chair? <laughs> oh. what yeah, no, your chair is fine. It sounded like it rolled out from under you. It's a roller chair. Uh, oh god. Oh. No. Oh. Hello. Oh, you're back. So, do you think the David Cage is getting worse at making video games, or do you think our taste is getting better? I don't know. I mean, just so many people praised Heavy Rain. Mm. I think he's just. He's being encouraged. He, it's the George Lucas thing. No one tells David Cage no anymore. Mm, mm-hmm. So, do you think there's nothing? Um, I mean, there's nothing beneficial about it because, like, even I, I tried to play Heavy Rain, and like after like the first hour, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not gonna do this mo- anymore. But like, if people like are into it and stuff, and it's like the the idea is that it's just like an inter- interactive movie. Like, do you feel like there's no reason for that to be around, even if like we don't particularly enjoy it? Do you think, you know, am I crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I get the sense from Jim's review anyway that it's not just that it's an interactive movie. Because you liked Heavy Rain more than, than this, which was also like an interactive movie, but it's just not a very good interactive movie. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It's like if you're going to reduce the um, gameplay and all this stuff to, like, if you're that adamant on forcing pure story and you're selling everything on that and that's what it all hinges on the story is going to have to be fucking incredible and david cage writes very childishly his understanding of the way humans interact at least in presenting them in a fictional sense is is the way a child would He's got sort of no way, no understanding of how to actually portray human relationships, and yet he insists on writing them. So you think the the, the, pr- the primary thing though is that it is is the narrative itself, and like the mechanics and the way it's presented, like that's less of a problem, or is that still a problem too? I mean, the me- the trouble with the mechanics is um, once you cotton on to the fact that nothing you do actually matters, you are basically just being asked to humor the game. Yeah, so there's no investment in, in your own personal actions. So all you've got left is the story, which also is just very, very boring at best. Well, and that's, like, I think where David Cage actually has the right idea is that the only way to really effectively carry the story you as the creator wants to bring across is to limit the player's interaction as much as possible. Like the less opportunity that the player is given to think about an alternative to whatever it is that you've laid out, the better off your story, the better chance your story has of remaining cohesive. Now, the, the problem then comes in if the story isn't very good, you, you're frustrating everybody. But I, sure. think, I think 
a lot of this is avoided if if he were just to just build the stuff as interactive entertainment and not call it a game. Mm. Right. Hmm. Well, other people are doing stuff where it is basically just the story and all you do is walk through a space and uh, occasionally well, press a button. The ironic thing is, is he fucking called Indigo Prophecy a movie? Uh-huh. He actually, <laughs> right. The one that's more like a game than the other ones, he actually called a movie. Well, at the time, it really was more like a movie than, than what we were used to. And the only only game I can think of outside of some Japanese releases like Metal Gear Solid and stuff that took that much of a, a movie-based presentation. And to get a, a Western developer telling kind of a Western-ish style story with that format in a game felt pretty novel when it first came out. It's like, oh, this could go places. Then Heavy Rain, people are all excited about technology and realistic acne textures and, you know, the moviest game ever movied. And uh, that came and went, and I think people are kind of over that, especially after playing games like The Last of Us and, and stuff that really melds um, cinematic technique and gameplay technique both at their strengths so well. To, to play Beyond Two Souls seems like really going backwards after that. It also kind of feels like, because like, there's always that thing where it's like, where is <clears throat> games Citizen Kane? And it's like, it seems like a lot of times it's games are on this linear progression to someday being as good or the same as movies, just interactive. And I think that's, to me, that seems like the completely wrong way to look at it. And so mm-hmm. like stuff like Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls like doesn't really interest me or whatever, because like, I don't really... I prefer games like way over movies, just because I do. And so, like, the Naughty Dog stuff, The Last of Us, Uncharted, all that kind of shit. I love that shit because I, even though it's like very cinematic and movie like, it doesn't feel like it's trying to be a movie. It feels mm-hmm. like it's trying to be its own thing. And like, right. like, like, I love you know Nathan Drake, like Un- Un- Uncharted, like it's kind of silly and overblown and all that kind of stuff. But like, so is Indiana Jones. But oh, sure. then, like the actual game and stuff, and 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 uh, how you go through the situations, like they don't try to heavy hand it, and uh, you know, I don't sure. know. I, I just make music. What the fuck do I know? <laughs> no, you're making perfect sense. They give you a big, larger than life set of characters and situations, and during the cutscenes, it can seem a little bit ridiculous, but you you buy into it because it's the language, the vernacular of Hollywood movies, and then you get to play it. And then when you're playing it, it's like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Then you watch a, a cutscene, you're like, oh, those guys. And then you play <laughs> it, and you're like, yeah! So, well, yeah. like, even just, even just like, the the, 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 the midpoints between uh, uh, the cinematic stuff and the game stuff, like, in the beginning of Uncharted 3, when you're, spoiler, a kid on the roof, you know, and you're doing that thing, and you're, you're following, you're following the guy on the roof and stuff, and, like, that's, that's, even though that's not, like, when you think of like what's a fun game? Oh, like walking on a roof. Like no, it's not. It's not. But it's like because that lead the, the way it leads from cinematic to something like that to that in that specific game. A lot of games try to do that. It just feels like it's leveraging the interactive component in a way that makes me feel more immersed in the story. And yeah. you know, and, and and just it can be done really well when they don't try to make it a fucking click this button to watch a movie game. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope David Cage plays some other video games and gets some ideas. Because he's still got a name, he's still got potential. He can learn from this. I think the problem with him is he um he, he knows how to craft a situation in which you could theoretically care about a character. But then he doesn't provide characters you could actually care about. Mm. There's one character in Beyond that when we first see him he is introduced as this sort of hard ass douche like who who we're not supposed to like and then because the game constantly time skips back and forth through uh, the character through uh, Jody's life the next time we see him she's fallen in love with him uh-huh. and and she tells us how funny and warm and lovely he is and the game never once shows us any evidence of this uh-huh. like even when you see him in other sort of parts of the storyline He's just this sort of, just a blank slate. He's, like Most of the characters are that. They're just blank slates. And we are then told what their personality is. And we are told what their influence in the story is. And then we're supposed to just kind of nod and go, okay, we're going to go along with this. 
It's one well, of the big problems is he doesn't um Cage doesn't know how to make a character that that actually has any kind of defining traits or personalities. Uh any personality that Jody has as a character it's basically all down to Ellen Page's performance because Ellen Page more or less plays Ellen Page in it. <laughs> you know, she screams, she does the half smile thing, she's a bit sarcastic. She's Ellen Page. <laughs> and she's a she's a, a great actress, but you know, she's been very typecast and because a lot of what Quantic Dream always has ever done is just kind of steal liberally from cinema. That's what they did with uh, Jodie, is they just stole from uh, Ellen Page's career in typecasting. Yeah, the uh, the cop in Heavy Rain was just a guy from a movie, right? Yeah, basically. Like, oh, remember that movie? Yeah, we just have that guy in it. Um, well, the, it brings us back to the, the overall criticism of David Cage, or the suspicion about David Cage, which is that he can't make a good story... So he tries to make a video game instead where the standards are lower and he can use uh, just immersing the player in the, in the game by suspending their... They, you can get their suspension of disbelief by being like, you're playing it, of course you like it. You are Ellen Page, you can't accuse her of being in a boring story because this is you. And uh, using video games overall is just kind of a cheat to be bad at making a story. Uh, do you think it's true? Is that a bad thing to say about David Cage oh. or a true thing? Considering when Heavy Rain first came out, there were a whole bunch of critics saying it's like the best story that a game has ever had. I think there's some merit to that. Uh, but even if it's, whether intentional or not, there is a truth to the fact that people, if they get the smell of a story that might be um, even just looking like it's doing something different, people are so desperate for that uh, that they will gladly, willingly, gleefully lower the bar themselves. And I feel, I said at the time, like, I, I respect Heavy Rain as a game. I like it as a game, as a story. I said at the time, and I still maintain, it absolutely lowered the bar for narrative in, in games. That mm. that is hailed as a masterpiece, or was. Most people change their minds after six months like they always do, and they will about beyond. In half a year's time, everyone's going to agree with me. But... <laughs> Before then, everyone was praising it so much, uh, it lowered the bar. And and someone like David Cage can call himself uh, the video game auteur, which he has called himself before, uh, and and never get challenged anymore because people have blown so much smoke up his ass. he genuinely believes that he is capable of single-handedly writing and directing a, a game, that he can do what so few others can. So could you can you give me an example though of like I, I hear what you're saying that uh, um, how he's trying to do this interactively but he's not capable of writing a quality story like if there was somebody who did like somebody who's who's really good Joss I don't know people but like Joss Whedon fucking Steven Spielberg I don't know but like if they if they were to do something that like David Cage tries to do and do it well what would that look like would it be more like what kind of story like what is what is the general pitfall that happens uh, uh, with David Cage or just games like this in general where the narrative is not structured in a way that works for a video game? Does that, you know what I'm asking? Uh, well, I actually, uh, I, I made this comparison during a panel at the weekend, but I think within games we already have a, a good analog um, in Hideo Kojima, who writes right. absolutely ridiculous, mad bullshit just like David Cage. But because he's crafted this sort of abstract, strange, not quite realistic world to go around it, no matter how silly everything gets, there's still this air of believability to it. And I don't think anyone can say that there aren't memorable characters in, um, in uh, Metal Gear Solid. Uh, you know, he's obviously made some very iconic and... and lasting characters people can still remember characters from the first metal gear solid whether it's liquid snake or psycho mantis or what have you uh, and he kind of kojima always did the opposite to what cage does as well like he uses the medium of games the interactive element to include the player in on the story rather than sort of freeze them out and force them to watch like the ludovigo technique right you know things like actually just breaking the fourth wall and addressing the gamer or doing the whole Psycho Mantis boss fight thing with the controller ports and all these different ways of, of 
just bringing the player into the world. And some of it very subtle, and it, it just makes the world of difference between what Quantic Dream has slowly gone and done uh, to what Kojima has done over his career. Well, here's a fantastic example of the difference between the kind of passivity that David Cage games require versus, say, Metal Gear Solid. There's a, that sequence. I'm trying to remember which Metal Gear was. I think it's four. Where you're crawling through a pipe, and it's exploding behind you. It doesn't matter how fast you go. It's going to end the same way. But it gives you the sense that you have to keep going. And you could let go, and you'd have the same result. It wouldn't matter. But it makes you so integral in the sense that you feel invested, as opposed to Cage's practice of making you feel separated from it and that it's out of your, your hands. Yeah. I mean, I had this similar problem with Homefront, that old THQ shooter that... Uh, oh, God. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all the NPCs were having more fun than you. They were opening all the doors, they were shooting all the bad guys, and you were relegated to a cameraman. You were there to just record and remember the actions of people who are far more important than you. The people who actually had motivations and goals and personalities and, and motivations and, and, and a reason to do what they're doing. You were some guy who was there to look at everyone else and think they're awesome. And Quantix steadily made a career of that. And that's not to say that that can't be done well either, for that matter. I would like to see some stories where you are the incidental character who happens to be there, and it's really about these other people, because I think that it gives you a lot more opportunity to develop fleshed out and interesting characters than trying to imprint them upon the player who is assuming this role. Uh, so that's not to say that that home front approach can't work, but it was really ham fisted, and they didn't. Oh yeah, it was done badly. Actually, let you have fun. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a character who is, you know, just a cipher, just there for you, your sort of benefit. I mean, how Half Life's kind of that. I mean, Gordon Freeman sure. is integral, but you are just being propelled along by other characters. But Half Life still sort of draws you in and gives you the player a motivation. You're invested. You want to see this through rather than something like Homefront, which just kind of drags you along and says, we don't care if you're having fun or not. Yeah, it felt like, the, the cool thing about Half-Life 2 for me was that it felt like Alex was following you and not the other way around. Like, I played Homefront 2, and it was the same same thing. Like, you feel like there, there's no agency. Like, the camera yeah. thing's exactly right. But, yeah, it's just, uh, with Half-Life 2, like, you, when you do everything, and, like, the only thing that, like, the, the other players would do is, like, I'm going to jump over this fence and hit a switch. Like, that's a totally different thing than, like, every single door is somebody else. Yeah. Uh, for me, the, the best parallel from David Cage games to games that I actually like is Ace Attorney. Because David Cage games, you generally don't do a whole lot. In Ace Attorney, you just, you know, I picked the book at the right time. And it's barely even puzzle solving. You're just looking at character animations and kind of deciding when you think they're lying and listening to them. But they ask you to involve yourself with the characters in order to move forward. You have to watch and you have to listen in order to solve these simple puzzles, which makes you like pay more attention to the, the story and the characters and makes you care. And you, you basically did nothing, but uh, I'm on the edge of my seat when I play those games. They're, they're charming, they're funny, they're, they're interesting, they're surprising. And all that happens is just watching people in a room chat. Yeah, I mean, there's, it, it doesn't take much to draw the difference between inviting you in and shutting you out and forcing you to look through the window. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't take much. Like there are, You're right, there isn't that much interaction in Phoenix, right? But there's just enough, and just enough emphasis on the importance of your decision-making that you get drawn in. Whereas Beyond truly does just thumb its nose at you. It just says, I don't care. I don't care if you care. And it's the contempt for, for your investment is worn on its sleeve. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if he just doesn't know how to do it right. Because it feels like contempt, but I bet it's just a, a bumbling flop well, that's been rewarded so many times. That'll, that'll be the really interesting thing for me, is if the Beyond Two Souls ends up making more money than Heavy Rain and uh, he's given more license to continue in this direction, then... I guess we get what we deserve at that point. Well, I've always been in two minds about that. Because it's... 
I'm annoyed at, at most of everything Cage says because I think the guy's just completely fucking clueless about most of the things that comes out of his mouth. Uh, I am also sad that games like Heavy Rain and, and Beyond are so critically, critically praised when I think they're adolescently written and uh, fail to understand the um, medium they're in. And indeed the medium of film that they try to ape. I don't even think they understand those very well. Uh, but at the same time, I do still totally respect that Cage does stick to his guns. I do still totally respect that the games are different than the other stuff we normally get. And therefore, I'm usually still pleased that they do well. Yeah. I'm still, I, I think Heavy Rain truly did lower the bar when it came to writing in games, but at the same time, it did do well. And I am kind of happy about that. And I would be kind of happy if Beyond does go on to sell a lot. Not because I think it's a good game, and not because I think um, Quantic deserves to feel proud of what they did. But just the fact that something like that could do well in a market where we're told things like that are doomed to fail uh, would still be a sort of vindicating experience. Yeah, isn't I mean, isn't a female protagonist in such a high-profile game like a really good thing? Like, you know, and <laughs> and point. games that aren't just shoot the guy, like, yeah. Absolutely. I agree I, with you, is what I say, I guess. I guess what I, I hope that, and I think that this happened with Heavy Rain. I think a lot of people saw Heavy Rain and were like, people are willing to play that? <laughs> I can do better than that. And then and they move forward and made games, uh, sometimes big, sometimes small, that that did do the, the story and gameplay mix and, and atypical situations and not just focus on action. It'd be interesting, that's Fulbright, if um, if Gone Home gave them any more, if uh, Gone Home was at all influenced by the fact that Heavy Rain did so well, a game where you kind of don't do anything. Uh, Gone Home. You reviewed that, didn't you, Jim? Uh, Dale did. Oh, Dale did, my mistake, yeah. That finally went up. He really liked it. Um, I think a lot of people can be influenced by David Cage, and that's a good thing if his success uh, shows people that they can take a different route with game development. I just want him to do worse every once in a while so he can do a better game, because if he keeps getting recorded for these kinds of games, then his games will continue to probably get worse, I'm guessing. Well, that's another big problem is uh, Cage won't take criticism. He won't. I gave Heavy Rain a 7, and he chewed Nick Chester out over it when he met him for an interview. He ha like had a proper go at, at Nick Chester and said, how could you rate the game like this? Look at how high it scored on Metacritic. Everyone else says this game is important. Whoa. Yeah, that, like his attitude really, towards you can criticism... Think that inside you know but to, to i don't even think if you're a creator i mean you've got the right to think that inside but if you're a creator you're committing suicide mm. if if that's your attitude toward criticism is well this person said it was good therefore i'm important therefore fuck you <laughs> even if the criticism is you know like seven is a good score even if they're saying it's okay but they're like no no it is brilliant if you don't see that, you are just a wrong person. Yeah, like, I, I think I, I can definitely see it from his point of view, because, like, I make shit and people criticize it or don't, like it or don't. And so, like, but I, I don't know, I feel like I grew out of that eventually, that, like, oh, if somebody only thinks it's 70% perfect and somebody else thinks it's 90, like, I, I don't know... I feel like if I if I did something like that just as a content creator, it's totally just a emotional reaction and so like I, I i i have some sympathy for like if, if that's if that's how it happened like i have sympathy because i can see myself doing that but I, there, there's a point where you just got to be like people are there are some people who are just going to be dicks even though you like you weren't like if it was seven out of ten that's not being a dick like there are people who would give it a two out of ten and just be total assholes but it's you can't get consumed by that and like you know argue with it if once you argue with people on their interpretation of stuff that you make like what are you doing like w w if, if you need to argue with somebody <laughs> over how good something yours is like i feel like that's a lot more about you than them yeah where is that possibly going did he think nick would be like hey man you're right terrible review that yeah, we did. i'll fire him on the spot <laughs> the way i look at it is if i if i if i had david cage's attitude 
um, my sh- show that I do online, uh, which is you know currently the biggest thing I ever do, uh, have ever done, um, would still be me in front of a white wall uh, playing to five thousand people a week, uh, and it is currently not that. And I I have a show I'm incredibly proud of, and it's only because when it went to the Escapist, there were a thousand comments telling me what a an awful piece of shit I am and what a terrible show it was. And with that many people sort of pointing things out, I kind of took steps to address that. And over the coming weeks and months, I crafted something that was actually good. And I think that's the really there's a... I, I'm just glad I'm not David Cage. <laughs> but I would even say it's it, it's 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 been cool watching you do that because like you you when you do that you kind of straddle this line between critic and creator because like you are a critic but you're creating a show but it's just, you know fucking Ouroboros eating its own tail kind of thing. But like it's I, I'm gonna compliment you here, but it's it is good to see how like when you talk to people like when you re- respond to people who give you shit. Like, sometimes it's just funny, they're fucking idiots, and you fuck with them, and that's hilarious, and that's cool. But, like, I, I, I never see you, like, doing that kind of thing where you're just arguing about the basic quality of your stuff. You keep it on topic. And I think that's kind of the point. Like, if you keep it on topic, if someone is being abusive and horrible and not constructive, there's a way to deal with that. If someone, you know, says your show is completely horrible, here's why, and everything they say is true, that's a different situation. Like, you have to... You have to take that and learn from it. Exactly, and I, you know, I had a bit of a childish attitude at first because the, I mean, the criticism did cross that line between they're saying good points, but they're also just being very awful people about me. So I was, I, I ignored it for a while and sort of tried to fight back. And, and but after a while, it's like you know what, the, the same criticism is coming up again and again, and that should be addressed. And we're seeing that with a lot of these reviews for Beyond. There are a lot of people, you know, continuing to just praise it to high heaven, but a lot of similar complaints have come out of many reviews on this one. It's a lot more mixed this time. And I think, you know, people are sort of are speaking up a lot more and just saying, you know what, this Conic Dream's way of doing things, it's, they're not good enough to do what they're trying to do. Do you think they're getting left behind too? Because, I mean, they've... Uh... You know, since Heavy Rain, we've had a few uh, Uncharted and Last of Us and that kind of stuff. And, like, the interactive fiction kind of idea has been raised, right? So it could oh, be sure, that they're yeah. just not progressing. I mean, Telltale's The Walking Dead right. humiliated Quantic Dream. And pretty much every other game, at least in the <laughs> big budget and better known sort of less indie sphere. The, I, it, it was a masterclass, as far as I'm concerned, in sort of character creation in a game. Uh and it is for Quantic to come up with its, you know, all of its technology and all of its emotional sort of talk. Uh, it, it couldn't deliver compared to something like uh, The Walking Dead. It couldn't follow that. And it's it certainly won't follow that while David Cage continues to believe that emotional depth equals polygon count. Like, it's all in the technology for him. It's It's... It's all about reducing the effort it takes to actually craft a good character when you can just have a perfectly screen-captured uh, animation of someone crying. It doesn't matter that you've not written a good reason for them to cry, so long as the crying looks realistic. Mm. That's all he seems to care about, which is kind of how sociopaths think. <laughs> uh, yeah, just simulating a feeling is the same as a feeling for him. It would be really interesting to hear what he thinks of Walking Dead and whether Walking Dead was influenced at all by the success of Heavy Rain, because that's a perfect example for a game that I figure might not have come up the way that it did if it weren't for Heavy Rain success and and Heavy Rain getting so much uh, critical acclaim. I bet him, Telltale saw that and were like, we can do that. We can do that better, but with zombies, and they, and they did. Um, I wonder if David Cage respects it, even though the graphics aren't that fancy. It's a fairly low-budget looking game. That'd be fun to find out. Why don't you interview him, Jim? Hit him up. Hit him up. Um, uh, yeah, I'll do that. He'll just do up. what he did to Nick. He'll just interview me about why I am so wrong. <laughs> that would be pretty. That would be pretty funny. People would like it for sure. Maybe he's just like a crazy performance artist, and he just makes video games that aren't video games, and then his whole performance is 
interviewing and criticizing the people who criticize him. And it's just like a whole meta thing. And that to him is the true art. Is yeah. the, and then, the and then while he's talking to you, like under the table, he's like fucking moving a PlayStation controller around like the sticks. To <laughs> manipulate. Mm, press him on that issue. Click, click, rumble. <laughs> <laughs> Should I do the questions? Yeah, you, go on. you want to do them? What are questions? We ask Podtoy questions to my Twitter followers every Wednesday. And let them know that we've got a special friend. Okay. I wouldn't go that far. Okay. The, we got a, we got, we got a man that we know um, sometimes. A man that we know. Taking dictation. Sometimes. Biblically. Period. Biblically, all right. Biblical dictation? Uh, I don't, can't spell biblically, apparently. Like, is that even That's a real word? Yeah, just not, just uh, let them know who it's... we've got on so they can ask some... Oh, questions. you want me to put it? Okay, Danny B. All right. <laughs> he is now announced. Uh, are you guys familiar with the song by Great White? Sometimes I think David Cage is the next Great White. You know, I got a Twitter handle. I don't you know do. if you know how Twitter works, but like when you say my name, you can actually do this. I thing. was dictating. If you want to say name, Twitter name. handle, I would have put it in. Straight dictation. Straight dictation, guys. You guys familiar with Great White? I heard Isn't that the one who... Did, yeah. Fire? Did, yeah, didn't they burn down? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. is not they burn down? I don't think they burned down. They sang a song basically about getting homeless women in your van and like keeping them warm and then having sex with them. And it was a top, it was a number one hit. I often think David Cage is the great white of rock and roll. Uh, you, remember, you remember it. Once bitten, twice shy. He's like, you don't remember when you had your last meal. Oh, oh you're so, so cold. No? <sighs> Look it up later. No, I, I, know, I, know, I know the song that you're talking about, yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you're given what you got. Uh, it, it's about getting homeless women in trouble. Uh, let's see. Claire, who is Hilda Tildy on Twitter, wants to know if we've ever seen any ghosts. Oh, uh, it's actually not Great White's song. Boom. Huh? Who is it? It was uh, originally by Ian Hunter. Oh. And uh, released in 1975 and then covered in 89 by Great White. So they didn't even write it. But they popped Hey, Jonathan, I'll cover you in my great right. <laughs> do you Don't get do that? It. Do you get that, Jonathan? Corey, Laura, I guess we're not going to answer the ghost question from Hilda Tildy. I've not seen a ghost, no. I have not. Nope. I've heard them bumping around. They were ghosts. I know it. Conrad? What? Have you seen a ghost? Mm, no. Oh, like I cannot say that I have I have seen. <laughs> you want to see the ghost? <laughs> Corey, Corey, Laura. White and pale. What is your ghost? Is it you? I'll haunt the shit out of you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get covered in some ectoplasm. I can see it now. <laughs> Jonathan. Yes. You should um, like give children a frightening treat at uh, Halloween. Why would I want to do that? Go to like the children's hospital, like on the terminal ward or something, uh-huh. and like get an erect penis. And Where would you get an erect penis? Like get your one all like hard, oh. like, wobbling right. it about a bit until it gets hard, right? Yeah. Then get like a, a, a napkin, a big napkin, or a, or a hand or a kerchief, a white one, and cut two little holes in it, and then drape it on your penis and then run at the children going that's mean to the children that's genuinely frightening because they think they might get sexually assaulted by older men it's the hospital's haunted penis ghost (laughs) sexually assaulted the only way to stop the ghost children is to grab hold of it and shake real hard until it bleeds you want what you want See, me i to... don't know if you're a ghost or julia child <laughs> <laughs> oh chicken i could be both and it bleeds and then sprinkles egg on it and put it in the oven for five minutes so do you want to be that do you want to be julia child's ghost penis i don't That's, that was the name of my jazz fusion band in college <laughs> 
Chris Donaldson, it'll be really good. No, coffee or no, die. I'm gonna, no, no, I'm going to stay on this for a while. Yes, you are. Corey. Yes. <laughs> you're going to run at them, Jonathan. Coffee or die. You said we should do questions. Right? You'll, you'll, you'll knock their IV drips with yeah. it. You go, oh, I'm haunting your IV drips. Because I'm a ghost. Mmm, I'm sweaty. Get that hand fan over there and blow it on me to cool me down. You're picturing me doing this. Yeah, you're, yeah picturing... like you're, you're fully naked, except for, like, some socks. And the napkin, obviously, over your tadger, which is playing the ghost. And you're just, like, looking at the kid intensely, just going, ooh, while thrusting your crutch towards it. Ooh, and all the doctors and nurses are clapping. They're saying, he is a ghost. He's a great ghost. Why is it? Why is it fun for you? Out of all the people you want to picture being terrible, I asked earlier, but I didn't get it. An answer. Why is it me? Why? Why is why, it? Why are you saying that I'm picturing you being terrible? The that doctors and terrible. nurses are complimenting you on your acting. You don't picture uh, Zach Galifianakis doing these things? You don't picture Summit Sarkar doing these no, things? No, they're busy. <laughs> I'm pretty, Zach I'm Galifianakis is busy starring in The Hangover 16. Summit Sarkar <laughs> is writing about the NFL on Polygon.com. Mm, good the words. Harlem Globe Trotters of game journalism, mm, yeah. Jonathan. Why yeah. wasn't we invited? And you have the time, the means, the dexterity, and the ambition to play a scary penis ghost for children. So if I lose the time, the means, the dexterity, and the ambition, of which I actually have none, but the, if you've I got more to, than Zach Galifianakis to do this. I have way less ambition than Zach Galifianakis, which is why. At I'm, least in terms of, do I want to uh, put a napkin on my penis in a children's hospital in Boston? He would, he would definitely do that before I would. No. He can be kind of troubling to people on purpose because it's mad. He's got a lot of <laughs> really angry guy. That's, uh, that's a, a shame that you've said that. It's true. He's he's known to be angry. You know, mm, he's it's your birthday, is it, young boy? Ghosts like cake as well. And that's like a birthday party at the hospital. And then you like just slowly push your kerchief covered penis into the kid's birthday cake. That's mean. Just slowly while staring at him, just going, ooh, ah, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh. <laughs> Why am I doing that? Why would I do and that? And then you crawl onto the table and you just start thrusting the ghost in because the ghost is digging deep into the cake to uh, haunt it from within. It's like possessing it like the exorcist. And you, oh, I'm possessing the cake. Uh, 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 like you're like on all fours on top of the table. And the kids are delighted. They're <laughs> I think I just got my new ringtone. <laughs> They're laughing at Jonathan while you're just sort of there, just fucking the birthday cake. Just, uh, uh, sorry, possessing the birthday cake scarily. Uh, uh, and then you just go, ah! Uh, uh, and then you pull it out. So, okay. Jonathan, do you usually just let him, like, tucker himself out, or how does this work? With Jim? It's a. Uh, yeah. And so sometimes he's really more adamant than, than other times. But the, the listeners love it. They eat it up. I'm not adamant. <laughs> you are adamant a little bit. Oh. Uh, Corey Laura keeps asking over and over again. He or she is at Coffee or Die on Twitter uh, asking Danny B to sing Usher's Yeah featuring Lil John and also Ludacris. I, how, how does that go? I don't think I've heard those. <laughs> I am it's white great. as shit, dude. Do you, I grew up in the suburbs of oh, Phoenix. Come Jim's on. He's even whiter than you, and he it's, loves it. It's song. Jonathan Holmes' favorite song. It's not. Uh, it's what he we uh, plays when he wears a mesh tank top and cut off jean shorts and dances on a low rider, all sexy. It's one of Jim's other ideas. And it goes dun 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 yeah, people love it. Uh, I don't. But people listen to the show often do. They it's your get favorite very, song. 
It's not. It's uh, it's. I wonder what Danny would think of it, because it's got. No... I've I've heard that. I mean, that's a song that's like in the in clubs and shit a lot, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, you yeah. know how I'm all about the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Jonathan Holmes invented uh, being in the club, and that's the, the song is many in many clubs played in his honor. <laughs> What's the name of the song again? Yeah, yeah. Like, that doesn't Usher. help with Google at all. It's it's done by Usher. Okay, Usher. Yeah. People are trying to troll you on Twitter, Danny. I'm going to ignore them. They are. What are they doing? Yeah. They're saying that you don't do anything. You just like press random buttons and music comes out somehow. No, that's true. That's not trolling. <laughs> <laughs> um, people want to know if we like the Big Bang Theory. This is James Rodriguez at Time Lord, Time underscore L A W D. I have tried to watch the Big Bang Theory and I cannot succeed at that. Me neither. It's, it's not the devil. Well, uh, like my buddy, my buddy came over the other day, and he's he's a normie. He's not, you know, he's a normal person, and not one of these crazy game people. And he's just like, "Oh man, do you like the Big Bang Theory? It's so funny." And I'm just like, "Dude, I I don't want to offend you because you like it, but like, all the jokes are like on me. Like, <laughs> there every single joke is just about like either misunderstanding something about my culture, whatever that is, or just like." oh, wow, video games are weird and for kids and, and like, the, all this shit about where they just make fun of them for, like, being the outsiders. It's like, dude, it's it's a joke. It's funny if you're not a part of it. Like, enjoy it. But, like, you're just bringing back junior high every time you make a joke in this show. And, like, I don't think it's funny because it hurts. Well, a lot of uh, self-proclaimed nerds love it because they're like, it's funny because it's true, guys. They like it when the guy right? says babloopers. What? <laughs> the man on the telly says babloopers. I would like that too. I didn't know about that one part. He looks at the camera and points at it and says, "Fuck you, Kablunkus." <laughs> that would be good television. I've not seen it. He gets the the nerd. There's a a main nerd, but he's not that nerdy. He's he's like how in a movie about a girl who's not pretty, but then she gets a makeover and becomes pretty. She is pretty the whole he's, time. He's 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 basically Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood unappealing, which he's is Hollywood nerd. very appealing. But he's totally normal, and he has weird friends. Right. One of them is uh, pretty famous now, I guess. He was in a Muppet that, one. That's the one that says Caspunkus. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, he goes Patronus. <laughs> I should watch that. Uh, Dorian is standard, unless Conrad wants to comment on that. Um, it's my parents' favorite sitcom. I've never... I've never. I've always sort of thought it was kind of dumb. Jonathan co wrote it. I did. Okay. Not. I'm sorry, Holmes. Yeah, I'm just, you, your work's not, you know, for me. I guess I just. It's, I was never insulted by it, despite growing up, you know, being kind of a, a nerdy guy. Um, because yeah, it is. That's just kind of the way it is. I guess I just accepted that I'm not, uh, or that I'm going to be the butt of jokes. So sure. that's I don't, fine. I don't, I don't know if I was insulted by it. It's just that, like, I don't find it funny because it's like, let's say there was a oh, sitcom no, about, like, if there was a sitcom about, like, NASCAR or something, and all the jokes were just about, like, public perception of NASCAR, and if you were way in a NASCAR and, like, you know, oh, that's not true or whatever, like, the things that it's playing off to be funny out of just which 90% of it is just like nerd culture is weird and hard to understand, and I don't get it because my kid has to fix my computer, so ha ha ha, you know, um, I'm I'm not part of that the, their their target, you know. It's yeah. Well, what do you think of Revenge of the Nerds? What? Um, I was like four, so it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched it again not that long ago, and man, I remember it being a lot funnier. No, not but that a... dude, the end of I don't know which one, the end of it where they do the fucking like live music show. Oh, that's with, the first like, one, yeah. Oh yeah, with the electric violin, that shit. That's I'm badass. Like, yeah. No, I see with Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah, it, it's kind of the same thing. And like, I saw that when I was too young to really understand any of the humor. So like, going back and seeing it, like, you know, having already been exposed to it before, I understood what like irony was. Um, I feel like it's kind of the same thing. Like, I'm sure like actual nerds, people who it's lampooning back then, you know, I can laugh at myself. We can laugh at ourselves, but it's just when the jokes are about misunderstanding things well, it's, it's the and difference. you understanding. You know, people have often drawn a difference between the IT crowd and the Big Bang Theory. The the IT crowd is written by Graham Linehan, who is pretty nerdy. 
Like, he knows the actual ins and outs of the things that interest us. Um, right. I mean, Jesus, the guy fucking has read articles on Destructoid and shit. Like, he's in deep enough. Um, and, you know, he did that show, The IT Crowd, which is massively sort of popular now. Uh, and there's this great blog somewhere that drew a difference between uh, the Dungeons and Dragons episode of being Big Bang Theory, in which, obviously, D&D &D and those who play it were the butt of all the jokes, and a, an episode of IT Crowd where they play D&D, &D, in which D&D &D and the people who played it were, like, woven into the jokes and were, like, in on the jokes. And it was laughing... It was laughing at the whole concept, but in a way that was laughing with us, as opposed to just laughing at people who play D&D. &D. And that was the big sort of difference, is you can have all this humour, and you can make fun of, of, of nerd culture, for want of a better term. There's a lot to make fun of, but if it's made fun of with a place of actual knowledge and intelligence, not only are you going to get something everyone can laugh at, you're just going to get better fucking jokes. Well, it's a lot like Eddie Murphy doing a stand-up routine, and then, like, oh, I don't know, Louis Anderson doing Eddie Murphy's stand-up routine. If from one direction, it plays really well, and from another, you might want to start running. Sure, yeah. sure. And just having it be about something other than, haha, they act weird. Having it actually be about how D&D &D is kind of funny, as opposed to, it's funny to play D&D, because that's weird, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gamesville. Jim. Dorian is standard, who I don't think has ever asked a Pontoid question that I'm aware of before. Wanted to know if you ever watched a British video game TV show called Gamesville with a Z. Gamesville. No. I've watched... No, I have not. I've, I watched Games Master. I watched Cybernet. I watched that other one, Bits, or whatever it was called. I've seen a bit of Consylvania, but mm, Gamesville is a new one on me. We should look it up. Uh, Terry Jr., who is at T Lad Yaga, T L A D Y G A. You should follow him. Wants to know if there's any old NES game out there that we think needs to make a comeback. Bayou Billy is my pick, says Terry. I was just thinking about Bayou Billy the other day because it is very similar character design to Aban Hawkins from Aban Hawkins and the 1001 Spikes, which is a game I'm excited about. I would love to see Bayou Billy make a comeback. We've got all the, the stuff for it now. We've got pointer controls and regular controls and uh, connect style controls for motion in and around. We can do it all. Bayou Billy for connect. I'd play it. I'd hate it. I'd play it too. How about you guys? Thing happen? Russian attack. Oh, wow, yeah. They made they a did one. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did that ever come out? I think so. I remember playing a demo of it. Yeah, that was I what, think like it's out, yeah. Yeah, quite that, a while back. After Bionic I thought Command it got canceled. Uh, I, mm, I think it's out on PSN and XBLA. After Bionic Commando Rearmed did really well, they just tried to do more of those. And then there was the... Yeah. Which one is the one with the rocketing opossum again? Sparkster? Uh, 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 fucking... Rocket Knight Adventures. Rocket Knight. Yeah, yeah. They brought that one they back as well. Yeah, that one was pretty good, though. Yeah, really? that was way forward. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see them uh, do Monster Party. I still haven't played that. Monster Party's great. It's very interesting. It's what such is it? A strange thing. Tell me it's about a platformer. it. Platformer. It's just a, it's a platformer, but it has like some of the the most bizarre enemy variety. And halfway uh, through it, one of the levels, it just like it goes from this sort of you know pretty twee NES era platformer. To just suddenly the level being all skulls and blood. It was very controversial for the time. And then you just sort of, you know, you'd fight... A, one of the boss monsters would just be a fried shrimp. I'm looking at the Wikipedia now, just a picture of a fried shrimp that just says, look out, baby. I think I'm going to play that tonight. <laughs> I've got that cartridge. That that a, I think I might actually uh, boot it up on the shield and then have a go on it there. Am I right in... Was, was Suda51 involved in that, or does he just like it? I'm remembering him talking about it for some reason. I can't remember why. I don't know. Human Entertainment made it. Yeah. That came out in the United States then? Yep. Uh, all right. I should play it. I hope it comes out on the virtual console. I will buy it. Uh, I guess we'll do one last one about music. Oh, Suda. Aww. Goichi Suda was uh, in Human Entertainment, so. Yeah, I think he did work on that. I think it's his fault in part. Um, 
all the more reason for it to come back. Jed Whitaker, who is at Jed05, wants to know, similar to our last question, wants to know what our favorite NES soundtracks are. His is River City Ransom and the Wizards of Warriors Trilogy, all three games by Rare. And they did have really good music. Yeah, those are all great. Yeah. Do you have any particular favorites? It doesn't have to be your number one favorite, Danny B. But if it's I was... One, um... Yeah. I was a Genesis Super Nintendo kid. I was yeah. I mean we had a Nintendo for a little while, but um but the ones I remember for sure are Simon's Quest, Castlevania two. Mm-hmm. Um obviously like Mario, but that doesn't need to be like mentioned, I guess. But like um uh, uh fucking Legendary Wings. Oh yeah. I was just thinking about that. Had awesome music. Um Metroid, of course. Um yeah, I don't know. I'm not I'm not too deep on, on those. Do you remember how the Legendary Wings music... There weren't a lot of songs for it, I don't think. It's just like two or three. I'm thinking of a melody, but it might be like it might be like a sitcom or something. It might not even be the right one. How's it go? Uh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> you don't have to do it. You can do it later. You can send me a link, because I'm curious about it. I'm just going to send you a link of me like singing into a voice recorder. <laughs> you know, I'd love that. Don't Don't tempt me. Don't say that and then not do it. I'll be sad. Do you remember Rygon? Oh, it was the right one. It was the right melody. Yeah? Can you hear it? A little bit. I hear more. Oh, yeah. Was that Capcom? I think it was. Uh, Back when they took more. Yes, it was. Yeah, just an angel lady shooting guys. Good game. Do you remember the Rygar music? I don't think so. You should. Check don't know that. if I played that. That that might be one of my favorites. Rygar on the NES, tough game to play. They took the, uh, they took kind of a Metroid route with it, but not quite as large and expansive. But you had to search around instead of just going left to right like in the arcade one. You had to find things and talk to a giant, giant muscular old man. Like you were yeah. normal sized guy. You go into a cave. And there's a, a sort of chubby, bald, bearded guy who's like 20 feet tall, sitting in a Buddha pose, just being like, "You need a grappling hook," and then you leave. <laughs> they should make a live-action movie out of that. Now I talked about it. Uh, <laughs> that music was really good. So listen. Yeah, to that. that was I really just... good music. Mm-hmm. That's one of my favorites. And I like the Guardian Legend. I thought that was a one that had a lot of kind of variety. It had these uh, sort of spooky ambient tunes, and then it had this really sort of awesome space flight music and i really enjoy that one but i think i think most of the really great game music doesn't really hit until the 16-bit era i i mean that's i don't know uh that's uh not, not that i disagree with you it's just like the, the the way i think of that is yeah i definitely grew up with genesis and super nintendo soundtracks and 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 they were a lot more flexible in what they could do um well, I mean, so there's this whole... granted the commodore 64 sound chip rules everything ever right, right. so it's not like yeah, but like the, just the thing about Nintendo music in, in in general that I think is is super interesting to me is that I, I'm I hear a lot this whole thing that like when you have more limitations you write better music and I don't necessarily think that's true I think when you have limitations you write differently and you can in some ways be forced to be more creative but with the polyphony limits and everything on on Nintendo, um, the way all the music had to be written um, seemed to. Uh, force people to write in ways that were much more exploratory of 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 four part harmony like if you know any kind of music theory if not it's just basically when you have like four different voices uh playing different notes together and stuff and not just like uh anyway um but like being forced to be that way and have like okay the bass uh alto uh, tenor and soprano voices all have to do something different and interesting because that's your that's all you have you can't make something sound cool through a sound because it's always going to be this square wave or whatever so the way all that stuff was written in nes is is very interesting um in that it's all kind of like classical ish kind of based because of the way you have to it's the only way you can really express anything um so i don't know about better or worse um but it's definitely, um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Help. No, no, different. It's probably and, more impressive. Uh, and, it's, and I think it's more um, conducive to catchy hooks to just yes. always focus on four-part harmony. Whereas with 16-bit, you have a lot wider right. range of things. Well, like, 
Yeah, like if you take the same composition, like stuff like oh, what, what always pops in my head first with Super Nintendo is, is Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, that kind of stuff. And if you take some of the compositions from like Final Fantasy VI and put them into Nintendo Sound Chip, where some of the stuff in Final Fantasy VI is just like a chord that is held for a long time, like some strings that just hold. If you do that with a Nintendo Chip, first of all, you're going to have to arpeggiate it because it can't play all the voices or whatever. Um, you can't just hold down a chord with a cool sound and use that to write. You have to fill all of that time with something interesting. And so that's why NES music, I think, is so like dense. And that's really interesting to me. Um, but at the same time, you can't do the kind of like, it's very difficult to, to have kind of an ambient soundscape of just like, it's much harder to, to elicit a tone that is not, hey, let's fucking kill aliens. You know, there's not a lot of subtlety, basically. Sure, which is why I'm so glad you picked out Metroid in there, because that's one of the ones that seemed like it wasn't necessarily going for catchy hooks and successfully yeah. just made me feel like I'm in just I'm in gonna die. I but am that's in what's, Yeah. Right. That's what's crazy about Metroid is like that's the exception. Like that's mm. one of the mm. only games that did it. Like you need this moody, crazy feeling. And I'm sure there's other examples that people are gonna yell at me or whatever, but like yeah, that's that's what's super impressive about that. Whereas, like, and because Super Metroid, you saw where they were going with that. Super Metroid, they had a lot more resources and stuff, um, and they kept to it. But yeah, I think Metroid One makes me feel more completely alone and gonna die any second than any other Metroid. It's the most horrific for me, and part of that's because of the graphics. Also, the the design is just so uh, evil. Am I still here? You guys sound so quiet now. Oh, ah. did, Jim, did Jim oh. fall off his chair again? Ah, I'm all right. <laughs> Phew, I thought I died. Right, I'm going to get oh, one yeah. of those special reinforced chairs that Val Kilmer has. Um, oh, there's one last question. we got to do it because it's serious. Derek uh, McEchern, I believe it's pronounced, who is at the Slaggy on Twitter, says, leaving for boot camp next week. Any advice from Podtoid? And this is one of those, remember when a guy was like, my grandmother's dying. She needs help from Podtoid. Give her some, you know, people ask these serious questions to us. To yeah, the, that is a mistake. Yeah, do what you're told without question. At, bo- at boot camp? Yes, just do what you're told. <laughs> That's all they want. It is, uh, from what I know of many people who have gone to boot camp, the more they can have it be an internal experience and the more they can learn to block out taking in everything and trying to filter all the information that's coming at them from people yelling at you and talking about you getting killed. Of course, you want to listen to all that, but in terms of maintaining yourself as a person internally and also just trying to turn it into a game for yourself uh, where you endure as much as you can and, and experience it without panicking to keep a outside perspective and think, yep, I am in hell, but I'm going to get through it. And it's, it's an interesting experience that not many people might have. And I'll be stronger for this. The more you can keep that outside perspective, the less likely you are to be totally scarred and damaged and in trouble. Did you go to boot camp? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't Sound like you're talking from experience. I know. I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, You've just seen full metal jacket a bunch of times. <laughs> it's uh yeah that's that's trouble now i'm sad yeah don't just don't go to boot camp you made me remember that that mean man that movie how about you jim what advice do you have for him uh go to poot camp what's poot camp it's something i'm going to be starting in your apartment uh in the coming weeks Jonathan. <laughs> why why people uh, like david cage you know people uh we were saying david cage shouldn't fight the, the people who criticize him instead listen and reject or accept the information as it comes. That's what I do with you. And people are always telling me to, to try to fight you, Jim. Do you know this? People send me tweets saying, don't let Jim abuse you again on the show. I'm like, he's not abusing me. He's just saying things. And I listen to them like boot camp. That's just, what somebody who is being abused would say. Ah, uh, so they're identifying with the abuser maybe. And the abused... Uh, which is me in their mind, maybe. And I think you should be a lot less like David Cage. Because I, I have these ideas for you because I'm critical that your life is not that. Not that good. And you are being arrogant and David Cage when you say, oh, no, I don't want to shove my dick in a kid's birthday cake. 
Yeah, it's a it's an interesting tit for tat. It seems like I'll should show you my tits if you give me your tat. <laughs> All right, we should end the show. What are we doing? Do, do we want to pitch what we're doing? You're doing Crypt of the Necromancer, Danny B. Are you doing I, anything else? Well, I guess I got to do my my blurb. I'm doing um yeah, Crypt of the Necromancer, rhythm based roguelike um which is. Coming out, I think, in March, I think is the goal. Um, I'm doing a game called Drifter, which is currently number 20 on Steam Greenlight. Getting there. It's uh, for Celsius Game Studios. It's like a spacey, freelancer, elite, space trader kind of game. Um, doing Desktop Dungeons uh, with for QCF Design, which is a kind of a puzzle, uh, roguelike dust, uh, uh, fucking dungeon crawler, whatever. Um, that kind of thing. Um, and there's the Isaac remake coming out. Um, and then there's um, a lot of stuff I probably can't talk about. <laughs> so, how is that? I did want to ask about uh, Rebirth. How different is the music going to be, you think, on that? I think we're still uh, figuring that out. Um, I'm not really sure how much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Unknown and probably can't say anyway. But yeah. it will be mute- different, maybe. Different, maybe. Maybe. Different, maybe. <laughs> uh, journalism. Uh, how about you, Jim? What'd you do? Uh, this week's Jimquisition over at the Escapist magazine uh, is called Reasons to Pass on Seasons Passes. Season Passes. And it's about that, basically. It's an informative title. It's about season passes and why I think they are dumb and shit and shit, Jonathan. It was uh, funny. On Destructoid, when you wrote about it, it was right after the season pass story about... Um, I think Arkham Origins. So uh, I think it was Assassin's Creed 4, maybe? I mix them all. They're no all bad. the same now. Sure. Um, yeah, so that, I did that. Uh, I should be having a, a movie defense force this week. I hope so. No rhyme down because of the Escapist Expo. Yartsy didn't feel like doing it. Oh. Because um, obviously he, he just got back to Australia. So that's a thing. Over at Destructor, there's obviously the Beyond Review that we spoke about earlier. Uh, also, my Now Bloody Playing series has a few new videos up. You can see me play Legends of Dawn, Legend of Aetherius, and uh, I just started today Indigo Prophecy that I'm playing um, for the timeliness of it. So that's that. That's more or less what I've been doing, Jonathan. What about you, Conrad? Um, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> uh, I put up a preview of Audio Surf 2 that's up on our YouTube channel. You can go watch that. And, nice. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, nice, right. nice and concise. Sure. Uh, right. I forgot to oh. mention one last thing. I'm sorry. Is that I'm doing Desktop Dungeons with uh, Grant Kirkhope. You know Grant? I do. I don't know him in person, but I know him on the internet. Yeah, so we're uh, we're doing that together, and he would be a uh, he would call me a twat and a cunt if I uh, didn't mention him. What is desktop dungeons? Uh, so it's like a I don't really know what to. It's kind of like maybe Minesweeper even. I don't know. Like it's so it's just it's I don't even know about turn base. It's just like it's they uh, they made a free version of it like like a few years ago. Um, totally free online, and it won the design award at IGF. And so they re they've re spending years remaking it and redoing it and polishing it and stuff. And um, it's you start in in just an area, and it's grid based, and you click to move, and and you like when you hover over a monster, like you're going to do so much damage, they're going to do so much damage to you. It's you just take your time with it and and do whatever. It's I I don't know what else to compare it to, but we're doing this really cool. Like, so first, I mean, it's Grant Kirkhope I'm working with, which is fucking insane. If anybody doesn't know, he did the music for like golden eye and perfect dark and banjo Kazooie, like a goddamn legend and kingdoms of Amalur even more recently. So like, he's, he's not like me. He knows what he's like doing. Um, but like, so we're doing it because the game is that way where it's not, there's not like really a rhythm to it. It's, you just do it whenever you want we have so much license to just fucking score it like however we want. And some of the things that like, I think of when it, did you ever listen to like Peter and the wolf when you were a kid? Oh, sure. Where it's just the whole like melodic light motif kind of thing. Like we're just going balls to the wall. Like the desert zone sounds like just fucking a Disney movie desert crazy shit. And then 
the there's this song where there's a troll on a bridge and i just did this uh like uh brothers grim fantasy kind of feeling crazy thing um but yeah it's it's just really crazy to really like working with fucking grant kirkhope and we're just awesome how how did you how'd you split up the duties on like did you collaborate on the track together he'd do one part he'd do one part or would you do the bass and he'd do the strings or something or would you just completely separate on what tracks you do but compare them with each other and like swap notes and whatnot duty (laughs) uh so it's been it's been fairly um uh fluid the way that works like uh um usually what happens is uh, I'll write some, you know, I, I wrote some things cause he came on a little after, um, I got started, I'll write some stuff and then he'll kind of write alternate versions of them to just, so like, okay, so we need a bunch of tracks for the desert zone. So like I'll do a track, uh, and then he'll do one that is just like inspired by it. Like he tries to just, uh, and he's crazy. He's a fucking like professional grown up kind of person. So like he does it perfectly and it just sounds like an alternate version of like what i did and so that would just be like okay so if there's this one kind of desert level and then there's one that's slightly different you know in a different context they're different enough to where like they feel like different places but they're still in the desert still in the same zone um oh. and so then what happens is, is i will take what he wrote and i will uh not really remake it but i'll kind of import it and smooth it over and everything N- not that he can't make good mock-ups or anything it's just that like the last you want to make it makes more sense to have one person do all the final uh, arrangements and, and, and mixes and all that kind of stuff. So it's like consistent. Sure. And so there's a lot of that where like a write stuff and it's, it's been, I've never done anything like this and it's been really fucking cool. Um, and he's just really good at it. So just the process of, of um, cross pollination, I guess you would say of like, it's crazy how like now when we write tracks we kind of know exactly what to do it's like it's like jamming with uh you know like drums and bass or something like you when you get into the zone you just know what the other person's gonna do it's like that like you know, just it's it's crazy dude i mean it's I, I've, I used to play in bands and stuff and that was that was the zone and now the zone is a completely different thing um i don't know i'm probably just crazy oh no, you've entered this new kind of internet makeout zone with grant kirkhope with music yeah we do like... naked skypes every day <laughs> <laughs> but it is like um, you're planning stuff in him and he's planning in you and then it's growing into different things all over the internet pretty crazy right yeah it's, I'm it's... happy about that yeah so i think i hope uh i hope people dig it it's something because one of my one of my only rules on the desktop dungeon music is everything has to be real, uh, mm. which is kind of different than most stuff I've done that people have heard. Because I I used to be a uh, for a really long time I wanted to be a film composer and I did music for indie films for a long time and I never even touched a even thought I would do a video game. But so I I did all this work for years getting good at like or, uh, orchestration kind of stuff and I'm not you know a, a guru or anything but like every single thing in in desktop dungeons is based on a real thing so it's a piano or, or something, even like the weird effects and stuff like our, our choir effects and everything. So I don't know. I don't know how people are going to react because people seem to think I'm like a chip tune guy. So they're going to love it. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? You got a cat on your head. Oh, I forgot about that picture. I should change that someday. I look scary in that picture. I look like uh, a little bit like the baby from dinosaurs again plus, like, a swollen man and cat head. It's trouble. Um, I should talk about what I'm doing real quick. I'm going to post the rerun of Sup Holmes with Lee Alexander, of all people. We're just talking about her. She was on Sup Holmes, like, a week and a half ago, but I was away this weekend, so I haven't been able to post it yet. I'm going to get that posted up, and hopefully that will also help promote this Sunday's live Sup Holmes with Ryan Vandendick. Vandendyke? I better find out how to pronounce that before I talk to him. He is a guy working on a game called Citizens of Earth, which is a Earthbound inspired satirical turn-based RPG. Makes fun of politicians. Makes fun of a lot of uh, social issues in America as they're presented. It's also lighthearted and fun and not um, mocking things in a, in a harsh way, but is a lighthearted spoof 
and just a fun game with great graphics as well. He he had worked on Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon as a gameplay designer as well. So he works for Next Level Studios in Canada. I believe they're in Canada. And this is his project he's been working on for years on the side. It's on Kickstarter. We're going to talk about it. It's going to be pretty close to the end by the time he's on the show this Sunday. So hopefully he'll get the money for it once to put it on PC. It's already on the Steam store, I guess, and also Wii U, I believe. That'll be this Sunday. I'm also trying to finish this article about what if Link was Blasian. Hopefully I'll finish that because it's important. Got to get to the bottom of that. Blasian. And that's it. Okay. All right, then. You okay? Right, that's sorted out, Jonathan. Yes. We got another one of these pieces of shit in the bag. That wasn't that and bad. And we're now going to fling a, a couple of thousand idiots. There were some good parts. No, it sure. was good. It was good, Jonathan. You, you liked it? I'm proud of you. You've been like a little dog let off its leash, getting to talk about games. I, you talked about it most of the time. Uh, you're tricking me. <laughs> You guys really um, just don't talk about games? Is this a real thing, or are you fucking around? It's, uh, I often bring them up, and Jim will behave as though he hates talking about video games, even though he does it uh, at, at least to probably more websites. It's hard to keep up with all Jim's websites. He clearly likes it, because he does it all the time. He did it before he even got paid money. But now, when I try to do it, he asks, like, oh, don't do that. How wooed. He's just like Jojo Binks. But I don't... I've never said how wooed. He's exactly like Jojo Binks, Danny. Exactly like Jojo... Right. That's what I am now. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, that's that, then. On that note, we will see you next week. Bye. You should listen to how Jim's like Jojo Binks on past episodes. Jar Jojo Binks? What the hell is this new thing? <laughs> it's funny. So is that it? Is that or? Yeah.